there will be times when the darkness seems to consume everything. And you're going to be asking yourself, what am I going to do now? What are you going to do now? But don't let it consume you. Don't let it consume you. Even in the darkest times, even in the strongest storms, even when the sun is blotted out and the world is falling apart, the darkness cannot extinguish your light. You. Your will. I got tired of losing. I got tired of coming up short. I got tired. I got tired of eating out of trash cans. I got tired of watching everybody else graduate. I got tired of seeing people ride first class. I got to go all the way to the back. I got tired. I hate it as much as you hate it. But the problem is I want it more than you want it. I got tired of giving 70 and 80 percent and not living the way I wanted to live. I see other people winning and I'm not winning. And I want to be a winner, and I'm tired, and I got tired, y'all, so I did something about it. I woke up every day and started grinding. I was tired. You got to get tired of losing. See, most people engage in low-life living, low-risk living. And so you want to begin to take some chances. You want to begin to challenge yourself and make it okay to fail and learn from your failures. Don't allow fear of failure and the allure, the attractiveness of playing it safe in life to draw you in. You can't get out of life alive. You've got to die to leave. When you actually change the priorities of your nervous system, when you rewire yourself day in, day out, you know, five, six days in a row in the environments we create, it lasts. You get huge change. When you see someone who's the best in the world at what they do, they're being rewarded in public for what they've practiced millions of times in private. You can't make a difference until you make a decision. So, some of you, man, you keep high. You complain about your job. You complain about where you are financially. You complain about your relationship. You complain about your opportunities. You complain it, complain it, complain it, complain it. Shut up! Stop complaining and do me a favor. If you want to make a difference, all you got to do is one thing. It's how you can start it. You want something different? Listen to me. All you got to do is make a decision. That's it. How do we come to know ourselves in terms of our personalities and more importantly, potential? One of the first ways to come to know yourself is to understand that you don't. You know, you can learn to kind of watch yourself like you're watching a stranger. So you have to understand that you don't know who you are. And that's not easy to understand because you think you know. But then, you know, you remember you can't control yourself very well. You're not very disciplined. You're full of flaws. Maybe you don't know yourself as well as you think. But it's hard to get low enough to understand how deeply it is the case that you are ignorant about who you are. Now, there's an upside to that, too, which also is that you're also ignorant about who you could be. And so the discovery of that, you know, is some reward for the horror of determining who you actually are. Then you watch yourself. You watch yourself like you're watching a stranger. You watch what you say and you listen. You think, well, what, what sort of person would say that? And how am I reacting emotionally when I'm communicating in that manner? You know, is that making me feel stronger or weaker? Is it, is, it, is it filling me with shame? Is it helping my confidence? Am I laying out a lie? Am I deceiving myself and other people? Am I adopting this personality at parties that is designed to impress and to amuse and it comes across as nothing but like self-centered narcissism? Um, what are my dark fantasies? What are my aggressive fantasies? What is it that I'm willing to do? What am I interested in so that I'll spontaneously pursue it? What do I procrastinate about and why? What am I unwilling to do? What do I think is good? What do I congratulate myself for accomplishing? And what do I berate myself for failing to confront and to implement? Those are all incredibly complicated questions and you don't know the answers to them. 
So that's a start. And then in terms of potential, well, you'll discover a little bit more about your potential as you discover who you are, especially the darker parts of yourself, because then you discover your potential for mayhem. There's some real utility in that, you know, the discovery that you're dangerous. It's such a useful discovery. It's actually something that strengthens you because the first thing that a realization like that can in fact produce is the ambition to incorporate that danger into a higher order personality. And that can make you implacable. That can make you someone who can say no when you need to say no. You know, that can make you someone who won't avoid necessary conflict. And so that's unbelievably useful. And so that's one of the potentials that you might discover. How can we explain that impatience of the young? Maybe it's because when you're a teenager or in your early 20s, one year seems like a very long time. Five years seems like forever. And 10 years is almost more than you can possibly imagine. But more mature individuals can actually look back 10 or 20 or even 30 years. And they can use the knowledge they've gained to create patience and a sense of perspective. A patient man is always richer than the impatient one because the patient man can always afford to wait. The patient man is never desperate. The patient man has time to spare while the man in a hurry is always on the verge of bankruptcy as far as time is concerned. In any situation you can think of, impatience is a source of weakness and fear, while patience is substance and strength. If you can only see the short term, if you can only think in terms of the here and now, then you are like a man with one eye. You can't judge distances. You live in a world that's flat and two-dimensional. In other words, the impatient person lacks all sense of perspective. Perspective lets you measure your plans and current events against things that have already occurred and also against your desires and aspirations for the future. Then and now, here and there, near and far, need and know, watch and wait. These are the dual optics that allow the patient man to see in stereo, where the nearsighted person sees only the present, or the dreamer sees only an imaginary future, and more likely than not, trips over his mistakes trying to get there. If you're in a hurry, if you need to see results tomorrow, you're putting a lot of pressure on everybody and there's likely to be a great deal of disappointment. But if you can afford to wait, you can ride out the hard times and eventually realize a profit. The odd thing is sometimes waiting for years is easier than it is to wait for a few days or even a few minutes. The best gift you can give yourself is to find something that motivates you. Find something that motivates you. Turn that motivation into drive. Once you're driven, you can then push yourself very far. But the biggest gift you can give somebody is that they see your drive. They see your passion to become better. And then you can pass along that gift that you have given yourself on to someone else to be better. That's the best gift you can give somebody. And, you know, most of us in life, we, we work so hard for things. We think life's going to be a certain way. But as you're going to discover, life is never a straight line. You know, we are taught that. We think line is just, I'm going to go from here to there. But if you look in nature, you never see a straight line in real nature. It's a straight line a human built it. So it's a process of evolving, of growing, dropping back, growing, dropping back. And, and challenges are what really grow us. A good book is only ever a book that you're reading at the right moment. Um, and the right moment is going to be a, you know, a bizarre confluence of, of needs and also a readiness to grow in a certain direction. I mean, there are moments in our life where somebody will tell you something and you're 
in inverted commas, not ready to hear it. In other words, the idea, though correct, may be so threatening and so potentially destructive to the way in which you've ordered your life at that time that you are not ready to take it on board, even though maybe 10 years later, you've grown more solid in areas and you can take it on board. A lot of good ideas are both good but also anxiety provoking. In other words, if we were really to listen to them and take them in deep, we'd have to change things about our lives. Maybe we'd need to get out of a relationship or into a relationship, change jobs, change our, our likes and dislikes. And sometimes we're not ready to make those intellectual kind of transitions. And so we need to block our ears. But the all too right now that a lot of us are dealing with, is what we don't want to deal with. It's the fact that we have to think about all these things that we don't like about ourselves. We like to use life as a big escape. That escape is not there anymore. All these distractions that we use, they're no longer there. Stop looking at me and other people out here to be the hero of your story. Knowing one thing in life, we are all very fragile in this world. We have to know that when we die, we die with some meaning and some purpose in this world. Your goal in business and in life on the important things is to make three mistakes per million transactions. And the only way you do that is by being a perfectionist in terms of double checking. The truth is very concise. The words are very few. But people don't want to hear the truth because the truth hurts. Okay, but you grow from pain. You really, you really do. You can't know how to deal with success. You can't know how to deal with failures. You can't know how to deal with the bumps in the road that if you haven't had a taste of everything. Thank you.